So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce you to my wonderful workshop presenters and colleagues. Um, today we have Paul Brenner and Genevieve Vigil. Dr. Paul Brenner is a planetary scientist and the NASA TOPS project scientist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. His scientific research focuses on describing properties of planetary interiors, as well as um, combining the multiple disciplines such as seismology, chemistry, rock and mineral physics, and simulating how heat moves through planets. Paul is formally trained in analyzing seismic data from quakes and noise from the Earth and Moon, as well as developing concepts for missions to other rocky planets or planetoids in the solar system. And we're so lucky to have Paul with us here today. He's an open science practitioner and enthusiast. He's been a part of the top team since 2022 and really has been a core member in development of the public releases of the Open Science 101 curriculum. So welcome, Paul. So happy to have you with us here today. And of course, we also have our second facilitator, Genevieve Vigil. She earned a PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Notre Dame in 2017, and she became a NASA postdoctoral fellow from 2017 to 2020, where she researched solar physics at Marshall Space Flight Center and developed novel solar sounding rocket payloads. She became a civil servant for NASA in the same group in 2020 and has been studying the solar atmosphere and technologies, especially to explore it since then. And Genevieve has a special role. She is our TOPS champion for the Marshall Space Flight Center and the deputy project scientist for Transformed Open Science, or TOPS. And she's really dedicated to expanding the adoption of open science principles to make science more accessible and reliable. So big round of applause for our amazing presenters today, Genevieve and Paul. You can put your reactions in the chat um, as well as at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Show, show them some space apps love. And without further ado, just want to thank Genevieve and Paul for hosting this workshop. And I'll pass it over to them to take it away. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Um, it's so wonderful to see the entirely global community being represented here. Um, really like to see all the participants and all their uh, nations of origin. So exciting. Um, all right. so. Uh, this is module one of our ethos to open science. Um, this is a part of a larger curriculum developed by the Transformed Open Science Initiative, um, part of Open Science 101. Uh, you've, we've already got some introductions. Uh, my name is Genevieve and Paul is here with me today as well. Do you wanna do any more of an introduction than that? Um, yeah, just letting people know, um, so, uh, you're going to see you're going to see uh, Jen here on screen presenting. I'm going to uh, stay out of her way for a little bit. <laughs> I'll go ahead and um, I'll be here in the background helping to answer your questions in the chat. Um, and during our activities, I'll be I'll be here in the background helping out. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'll I'll go ahead and close out my screen so that you don't have to see me and um, and let Jen take it away. All right, thanks, Paul. Um, all right, so welcome. Um, thank you all for being here today. Uh, just before we get into everything that we're going to cover in today's talk, I just wanted to start off with a quick agenda. Um, we're going to obviously have some welcoming remarks. Um, we're going to go through five different lessons that are part of the module one of OS 101. Um, that is, what is open science? Why is open science important? Um, uh, considerations of open science, concerns and fears towards adopting open science and planning for open science from theory to practice. Um, and then we'll have some closing remarks at the end. But just so you know what we're, you know, kind of how it's broken up and, you know, we'll transition to different sections at a time. This is the basic core of what we'll be learning today. Um, so 
primary goal of Transformed Open Science is to be inclusive to the largest number of contributors as possible and very diverse backgrounds. So we want to start off with this code of conduct. And we just ask that everyone treat each other with respect, basically, um, and agree to, to, to doing so in today's workshop. Um, so to move on, uh, the curriculum that we're going to be presenting today is uh, thanks to the contributions of many, many, many individuals, over 3,000 um, different participants in the TOPS initiative in the TOPS community helped develop this, this curriculum that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and everyone, we just want to send a thank you to everyone around the globe who has worked to promote and implement open science over the years, um, paving the way for what we're doing today. So big shout out to all of those participants. All right, and uh, just to get a quick icebreaker activity in, um, we heard from a lot of you and where you're from, um, but if we'd also love to see in the chat, um, you know, besides your names, maybe if you could write in five words or less something about what you do or something about yourself, we would love to see that in the chat as well, just to kind of know a little bit about our audience, um, where you guys are all coming from. So please go ahead, we're gonna take a few minutes now and and uh, and you know read through some of those uh, chat chats. Paul is going to be monitoring the chats. And do we have some participants going yet? I'll probably open the chat too, just to see what's going on. Yeah, I see some. So we have um, Hooray. Uh, she says, "I am a student." Yay, students. Yeah, that's great. Uh, we have, uh, oh, oh, they're coming fast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, so many, so, so, so many. Good. So many. Well, it's hard to keep, it's not. Index, uh, researcher and financial, finance professional. We have all sorts of backgrounds here. This is this is wonderful. Yeah, really cool. It's just really cool to see everyone who's interested in both space applications and also just, you know, open science, getting it out to the community. Love it. Teachers, yes. Cool. Hackers, cool, very cool. All right, yeah, keep, go ahead and keep posting those. Um, we'd love to have that record of just the, the kind of audience that we're in, interacting here with today, but um, we're gonna keep moving on. Um, thank you for everyone who is participating so far. So um, the TOPS initiative is really kind of under the umbrella of NASA's Open Science Initiative, uh, which was established to enable and support new and existing NASA funded research, research researchers practice open science throughout the entirety of the research workflow. Um, and so they support a lot of different areas, including infrastructure and policy making and funding opportunities and building of training opportunities. Um, and TOPS really falls under that training opportunities. The curriculum was developed so that the community had the tools that they needed to start adopting more and more of these open science practices. Um, and so TOPS is this five-year initiative to do just that, uh, to accelerate the adoption of open science. Um, and that's where this curriculum is coming from and coming to you uh, through the open science, uh, NASA's open source science initiative um, and the TOPS initiative. And as part of that, the outcome is this uh, Open Science 101, a five-part, five-module curriculum that covers first the ethos of open science, and then it goes into some of the specifics of you know, the tools and resources that are available to actually achieve open science. And um, we'll talk about later in the in the presentation where you can go to get more information on the rest of the modules and to actually take the rest of the modules so that, you know, you might earn your own badge and your own little special pin um, that, you know, gives you some credentials for knowing about open science. So we definitely encourage you guys to explore that further if you have interest. Um, and today we'll go ahead and start with our module one, lesson, lesson one, what is open science? And I know Marie already gave a pretty good definition. And just to expand on that idea, 
Open science is the principle and practice of making research products and processes available to all while respecting diverse cultures, maintaining security and privacy, and fostering collaboration, reprodu reproducibility, and equity. Um, so this is really a really good definition. It hits so many different areas. We're trying to make science better in every way, really, and include more people in that definition. Um, and here's a, here's a couple of examples that we like to use to demonstrate open science. I actually make this play. Okay, good. Okay, so um, open source practices and principles can be applied in all stages of research. Um, here's a good example of uh, the crowdsourcing Kepler, Kepler data that in 48 hours, more than 10,000 people had participated in a kind of a civilian or um, Oh my gosh, what is it? Citizen, citizen science area. That's the word I'm looking for. Citizen science experiments uh, to find exoplanets classified over 2 million systems. Um, and some of the results of that found 44 Jupiter sized planets, 72 Neptune sized planets, 44 Earth sized planets, and 53 sub Neptune sized planets. Um, so these kind of citizen science. Um, experiments really enables a lot of different kinds of participants to see some data and do, you know, do what scientists are doing all the time. Um, oh, sorry. Out of place. There we go. Um, and just a really great opportunity for for data to be observed and explored um, in new ways that wasn't previously accessible before the dawn of open science. Um, Here's another really fun example. Um, if you've ever seen weather forecast data, for example, for any location, that data comes from uh, NEXRAD radar stations, many of which have been operating for over 30 years. And the data has always been publicly available, but it was very difficult to obtain. Um, we mostly used it for rain information, so stations didn't need to make it readily available after 24 hours. Um, so users who wanted like a historical data from NextRed had to work through this very cumbersome process of going to a website, making a request, waiting for the robot to read the data off of tapes and storage, get it online, get it on an email, you know, then users could download these big, massive data sets. Um, and it was basically impossible to do large scale analysis and nobody had the time to make these requests and download the data, et cetera. But in 2015, all NextRed data was moved to the cloud um, and usage doubled. People could access it and just very quickly get that historical data and use it for various purposes. Can I make, oops, I thought this was a movie. It does not seem to be playing though, sadly. Um, and this is a really fun example of how the data that was intended to be collected for weather predictive purposes ended up being useful for a, a completely unforeseen purpose of studying uh, the migration patterns of the Purple Martin. Um, right, so here's the actual, yeah. Uh, the better land manage, managers understand current migration patterns and foresee behavioral changes in these birds due to climate change, the better they can direct their conservation habitat restoration efforts. Um, and the newly accessible radar data provides valuable insight needed to achieve their goals. Um, and the study was funded by NASA, uses NOAA NEXRAD data, and made fully available for the first time uh, by the AWS Public Data Program. Um, so this is a really cool example of how you can build an instrument and collect the data, and you think it has one purpose, but you don't even know until you present it to the world how else it could be used and how else that data could really solve interesting problems that you didn't even know existed. Um, and that's only possible because those things are open. Um, so obviously, you know, these are some good examples of open science, but when we say the phrase open science, which you may have heard before, maybe you haven't heard before, um, but it means different things to different people depending on the communities that you're talking to. Um, and so what we'd like to do is just spend a few minutes um, asking you guys, what do you guys hear and think of? What concepts come to mind um, that you associate with open science? And you can participate in this by going to this uh, QR code um, on your phone or device 
um, and participating in the Slido, and we're going to generate a word cloud um, to see all of the different you know, words that people, words and phrases that people connect with open science. We'd love to see what you guys think. So we'll go ahead and start entering your words now. I think you can enter as many words as you want. So go ahead and keep on entering. Okay, we got some coming in. Freedom, science, accessible, love it. I don't know how quickly it, uh, it updates. Good, I like it, yes, open science is good. Big data, yeah, I like that one a lot. Big data because big data, like data, gets very big very quickly, and having it able to be accessible in open science mechanisms is the best way to process that. Advanced, enabling, innovation, usable, powerful, accessible keeps coming up. Innovation, galaxy, <laughs> I like that. That's cool. Yeah, enabling innovation. I'm good. Accessible. Okay. Accessible is getting really big here. Public. Smiley faces. Advanced. Transparency. Ooh, I love it. These are flowing in now. Transparency. That's a really, really good one. Making science more transparent and um, yeah, freedom. Science. Yay. I'm loving this word cloud. I don't, I'm kind of wondering what shape it will ultimately kind of convalesce to. <laughs> Scientific integrity. I really like that. That one. Inclusive. Absolutely. Free to all. Free in all the, the, the ways that free can be meant. No barriers. Progress. Open. Enabling. AI, okay, good. Citizen science, big data, magnificent, maintained, maintained, interesting. Yeah, AI is getting big of a reliable, yeah, reliable science, transparent science, inclusive science. Love it. And I'm sort of like inclined to just let people go forever because this is just so interesting to watch it kind of fall, flow and evolve. Um, we do eventually have to move on. Valued. Messy. Ooh, I like that. That's kind of good because, yeah, it is kind of messy. You you open the kitchen to a lot of cooks and you end up getting some messes. Yeah, that's that's fair. But sometimes the mess is good too, right? Absolutely. Preprints. I like that. Data sharing, crowdsourcing, vision. Okay, these are awesome. And go ahead and keep typing as we move on because I would love to see how this word cloud develops over the course of the presentation. I think it'll keep going. Um, I'm not really sure of that, but um, we've done this activity in a, in a couple of other platforms and we've, you know, a lot of people come up with words very similar to what you guys have come up with, but, you know, you can see some different things here too. Um, Shared and tools and workflows, transparency, access, fair driven, free, diverse. Yeah, I mean, a lot of these concepts are being, you know, echoed, but, you know, there's some diversity of those concepts too. So it really is a broad term and it means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And it's so cool and interesting to see that, that, that range. Um, so another way to think about how open science touches us and impacts our world is to think about how it operates in our scientific workflow. Um, and depending on like how closely you're involved in, you know, the making and using of scientific data, um, you might be quite familiar with this. Um, you know, you might go out into the world and search for what is already out there. Uh, you might start developing ideas based on what you've seen out there, design a study, start gathering the materials to perform your study, um, collect your data or do your experiment, for example, then you're going to store that data somehow, you're going to analyze it, process it, interpret your findings. Usually you're going to write some report and then you're going to publish that report. And, you know, the, the whole cycle starts over now. Somebody else can go and use the, the science that you have made and shared. Um, and, you know, that goes for kind of any kind of really process workflow, even if it's 
code alone or, um, or, or you know, deeply involved in the scientific uh, research process. Um, but we'd, we'd like open science to touch all parts of this. And there's ways that open science can be used in every single segment of this scientific workflow. Um, and so the next activity we'd like to talk about is thinking about some of the traditional mechanisms, specifically of collaborative science, that may or may not be established already with patterns of openness to them. So for example, we'd like to think about conferences. Um, how open are scientific conferences as they stand now? Um, and you can participate in this by writing some answers in the chat, or you can just unmute yourself and chime in with some um, some ideas that you might have, um, thinking about, you know, costs and efforts and how people participate. How open is this traditional mechanism of open science? Um, it could take a few minutes for people to chime in. For example, um, sometimes costs can be very prohibitive in conference attend uh, attending a conference. You might have to travel, especially a lot of our audience today being global. Um, the conferences you might want to travel to are in places that are very difficult to get to, even if you have the money and time, even just getting the visas worked out sometimes to travel to these places can be challenging. My chat keeps updating very slowly, so. I don't know if you guys are. I'm, I'm hoping to uh, answer some. Oh, okay. Chat. Great. Okay. Pause on the chat. Great. Um, there we have conducting conferences in different places, like using this, the same way NASA space apps are conducted. Right. Yeah. Space app, like the way space apps is operating right now with these like completely virtual um, collaborative efforts, really interesting way to open that up because. All you need is a computer. You don't need to travel or think about childcare or think about, um, you know, getting a visa or paying the hundreds of thousands of dollars for travel accommodations. Um, yeah. So, so some suggestions that we have to, you know, increase the accessibility of these kind of mechanisms is is by doing things a little bit more online. Poster conferences, talks, and materials online with the citations and make them more accessible. Uh, conferences with decreased prices, especially for students, um, um, are fantastic ways to get more people there. Virtual participation, hybrid sessions, um, turning on closed captioning so that people who maybe are um, hearing impaired um, can participate more frequently too. It's okay. And, and, you know, at the end of the day, it is okay that, you know, there are some limitations on how open a conference can be. Like we, this, the goal of the conference is still to collaborate and present scientific information. And at the end of the day, not everyone can, or not everything can be open all of the time. And it's okay to have some barriers, but to try to open up some of those barriers so that we can get increased participation. Here's another example that we'd like people to think about is journals, the tr traditional publication mechanism, um, which is one of the, the primary ways that science is disseminated um, in published articles. And a lot of these um, are only available if you rent or buy the article or if your institution rents or buys that article. So if you're not part of an institution that provides that for you, you just might not have access to a lot of uh, published materials. Um, or you can only access it at great material cost. Um, you might have to have it a subscription. There's also the concept that a lot of times you have to pay to publish as well um, to make your articles even open themselves. So that also limits who can publish. You have to have the funding available for you to, um, so maybe you have a great research project, but getting that extra bit of funding so that you can disseminate the information to the world can be kind of challenging. So these are some of the, you know, mechanisms that we, we'd like to analyze from, you know, the traditional ways that science has developed and, and just try to think of ideas for how we can make them a little bit more open. Um, and, and some of those suggestions, you can make your code and data open available, even if the research articles themselves are, are potentially behind paywalls. Um, 
you can publish in open access journals and a lot of really good ones are available these days, really reliable, reputable, open access journals. Um, and if you publish in co closed journals, you may put your materials on an archive or a preprint um, that is more openly available so that the same content can be accessed in different mechanisms. Um, and, and all of those things can give you DOI so that can still be cited and um, people will still get all the same credit and you know connect everything properly. Um, so there's, there's a lot that we can do to kind of navigate some of the, the, the barriers on these traditional mechanisms. Okay, so now we can move on to lesson two. Um, why is open science important? And I think this community might already have a good idea of why it's so important to do open science, but um, a good way to maybe start talking about this is to think about an example of when closed science or the fact that open science wasn't regularly pr practiced um, really limited and put up barriers in, in the workflow of scientific progress. So. Here's an example of um, a 1990 analysis of satellite data on climate temperatures concluded that the upper atmosphere was not experienced warming, in fact, that it might be cooling. And so, and that directly conflicted with some of the, the models, the climate models at the time. Um, and that led policymakers to conclude that scientists didn't really understand the models and the data well enough to actually change how they were making policy decisions. Um, and it actually took um, eight years for errors in that original publication to be discovered. Um, I think it had to do with uh, not accounting for the orbit destabilizing and actually changed how you would analyze the data. And it turns out that, you know, that was just an honest mistake that was being made that didn't get discovered for eight years. Um, and they weren't accounting for these, these factors in the processing of their data, which actually led to the opposite conclusion that the atmosphere was indeed warming up, which was you know, backing up the models at the time. Um, but that already left many years for policy to be made in the wrong direction or not changed at all. And then it took another five years after the mistake was pointed out for the funding to be acquired to actually go back, look at the data and properly analyze it. Um, so thir total of 13 years after the publication of the original paper to show that the error and to fix it. Um, and that's the timeline at which policymakers can now start going in and start letting those um, discoveries drive policy decisions. Um, so you can see how closed science practices can, and can be very detrimental to society and to scientific discovery. So um, another reason why we might want to practice open science is that traditional publishing limits participation quite significantly. Historically, scientific publishers have charged subscription fees to access journals and often articles processing charges um, to cover costs of preparing the manuscripts, the press, etc. cetera. Um, so open access publishing significantly increased the number of articles that are available. Um, and and this, this, uh, this is really important also for the concept that the public funds a lot of the science that is being performed, especially at NASA, for example. Um, so it's, it's excellent that we, or how can we really ask the public to trust science um, and to understand it if they can't even access some of the basic materials that you might need to, to think about it. Um, so, so having only 30% of um, publications being accessible and the vast majority of the rest of um, publications not being available, and it's still kind of um, particularly on researching on, on climate change, for example, where it's more of a 60-40 split, um, there's still a lot that can't be seen by everyone. So open science can also accelerate the pace of science. Um, and we all experienced COVID a couple of years ago and the whole world went on, on panic and, and alert and the entire scientific community got on board to try to solve the problem collectively. And um, this is really a good example of how open science practices can facilitate the pace at which science is performed. 
Um, research was done very openly. Researchers immediately knew what was working, what was not working because it was being shared. The data was available for everyone to work from. Um, the genome was available for everyone to work with. And that very rapidly facilitated the dissemination of effective methods um, and effective vaccine development um, and mitigated you know, the worst pandemic that our species has seen in 100 years. So um, another great reason why you might want to practice open science is that you get more credit for the work that you are doing. Um, a lot of scientific research is not just the end result of your published you know, report at the end, but it's years of other work that you're doing. You're writing code, you're processing data, you're making research talks, doing lectures, et cetera. And all of that is citable work that you can be getting credit for um, and people can use and will use if, if it's available to them. Um, so you getting more credit for your own work is a great reason to participate in open science. And if you want credit, then the best way to make sure that the whole community is, is uh, acting as good actors is to also give credit, acknowledge credit where it is due. Um, if you're using other people's work, then give credit where it's due. Um, there's also a lot of other additional improved scientific accuracy adhering to open science practices potentially offers personal career benefits. Um, publishing open access increases citation count by about 18%. And articles that make their data openly available um, via direct link is 25% higher chance of citation impact. So this impacts our careers, your careers, because more people can see your work, more people can cite your work, more people can use it. Um, and so you have a bigger impact in the scientific community. And there's an additional set of benefits to you um, one of the biggest ones, I think, for me is that um, you never lose access to the work that you've already done. I don't know how many times I myself have had to rewrite code that I wrote two years ago because I just don't have access to it anymore because I moved jobs, et cetera, or just didn't save it in a repository that was, you know, going to last for a while. So that's a huge benefit. It also strengthens uh, funding proposals because funding agencies um, get more return on investment the way that they see it. They get more citable, publishable um, outputs from the science that they're funding. So they're getting a bigger bang for their buck, and that strengthens your proposal when they're going to go read that proposal and decide whether or not to fund it. Um, well, documented research products also demonstrate the quality of the work and helps the public communicate better so that, um, you know, what the public sees is a more complete picture of your of your scientific efforts. So the, the capacity for the public to misinterpret and make mistakes based on your scientific progress is you know, less likely. Um, and it attracts better collaborators. People will see your work, people will realize the quality of it and be able to go and talk to you and make you know, more connections. Um, additionally, we're really broadening the concept of who is a researcher, who is part of the research community. I'm sorry, I keep hanging my computer. Um, so it's not just, you know, traditional researchers in their labs and in their, you know, offices writing their code and processing their data. There's people everywhere touch the, the manufacturing of, of data and research products. Um, citizen scientists and there's educators and students, um, community members, various forms of engineers and technicians, the, the policymakers, the journal writers, etc. The general public, the taxpayers, for example, everyone is kind of involved in the production of these scientific products. And opening up who can access those when and at what levels um, is a really good way to just broaden the concept of who is participating in research. Obviously, um, you know, these are really great incentives for practicing open science, but science as it is typically rewards results and specifically results of the hero scientist who is, has made some great new scientific discovery, for example, Nobel Prizes, are awarded for new impactful scientific discoveries. And the years of effort and other collaborative efforts that went into that work are rarely acknowledged, and they're definitely not given Nobel Prizes. Um, so there is this misalignment between what our culture values in science and, you know, 
um, how to, to how to make those processes a little bit more open. Um, so there, there is some nuance to this. We haven't figured everything out about open science, that, that misalignment of, of goals and what we value in our society and culture, this, the culture of science. Um, so we have some more work to do, but by everyone participating in open science, we kind of change the way science is done and make it better for everyone, improve science for the whole world. Okay, so to move on, on to the next section, there are some considerations of open science that we would like to think about. Um, for example, here's a few cases. Should high resolution imagery of undiscovered indigenous sites be public? Um, should AI identified locations of sensitive bird nesting sites be put online for anyone to see and go to? Is um, Yeah, and identifying people um, to to um, impact their privacy. Is that something that we always want to be making public for everyone? And um, this is a good opportunity too, if, if anyone wants to unmute or write in the chat, just other ideas for, for places and areas that you might think, maybe it's not a great idea for everything to be open all the time. Um, please feel free to enter some of that in the chat or if anyone has a good example, uh, you can go off mute and speak to one. five new messages can any, can anybody share some uh, an example in their field where maybe something shouldn't be shouldn't be shared shouldn't be open I'm monitoring the chat for you um, and please feel free to come off of mute if you wish to speak it out loud Okay, so what about oops, it moved on me? Um, I know. That's what about funny. what about not being honest about credit plagiarism? Yeah, that's definitely a concern. Share, share. So, so there there are different types of data um, that that sometimes should not be public. Right. Definitely considering things like privacy or cultural differences. Um, we have to think about those, those kinds of ideas. Um, yeah, and, and, and as much as we'd like science to be for everyone all the time, there are things that we, we need to think and hold a little bit more sacred. For example, human patient privacy, for example. Um, Um, in the U.S., at least, health data is protected under health insurance um, on, on the HIPAA Act, and it is not allowed to be shared without express written consent of the patient. And that makes a lot of sense, right? I mean, if you're going through a lot of medical issues, you don't necessarily want all of that information being spread all around the world for everyone to see. Um, that's a very reasonable consideration. Um, so working to balance the publicity of that data with, you know, still protecting the patient and the individual themselves and their privacy and their right to privacy um, is, a, is a very important concern. Um, another example here, scientific research tends to be performed uh, by the dominant majority and powerful segments of society who often have not paid much attention to the effects of their activities and, and what that, how that impacts the groups that they're studying. Um, so open science advocates making research widely available while also recognizing that there are many reasons why some information should not be made public. Um, for example, archaeological discoveries um, can be formed by using LIDAR data, but what if releasing that data might reveal unprotected, vulnerable indigenous sites um, that do need to be protected and, you know, the cultures themselves who want to protect them aren't in a place of power to do that protection on their own. So privacy is their one tool to, to use to protect 
some of those important um, um, heritage sites. Or for example, rare animals may have their breeding sites kept secret just to conserve them, just so that people don't go to them and kind of destroy their habitat. So there's some very good reasons why the details and you know some data should not be totally publicly available because we cannot trust the entire public to treat those areas with respect. Um, and here's another good example of when you might be concerned about when to keep things maybe less open is when intellectual property and patent patents start coming into play. Um, I don't know how globally this is known. Taylor Swift is pretty global, I think. But um, uh, here's an example where, you know, the person who made the IP was not actually the owner of the IP because she was, um, you know, all of all of the songs she recorded were actually owned by the record company. Um, so when there's IP uh, uh, circumstances uh, surrounding what is actually being generated, it has to be considered for legal purposes that it can't always be shared. So, um, but in general, why should why should we care about IP and intellectual property and licenses, et cetera? Um, considering what happens to the ownership of your research is if you move institutions. Um, can you take your papers and your drafts and your presentations and your copies of publications with you? Can you take your data? Can you take your software? That is all going to depend highly on the institution and organization that you work for. And it depends uh, significantly. You can't always bring all of those things with you as much as we'd like to. Um, for legal purposes, you can't. Um, there are some common types of intellectual property. And we'd just like to kind of cover those real quick. There's copyright. And this is possibly a little bit more relevant to uh, the Americans in the audience, and this is probably going to vary greatly from country to country, but uh, copyrights protect artists, artistic work, and liter literary work. Trademark protects um, phrases, symbols, designs, logos, etc., and patents protect uh, different types of inventions. Um, that's definitely in the U.S. how that works. Um, but licenses for the purposes of open science it's really important to establish licensing because this really helps other people understand how to reuse your data and your work legally. Um, so to make those mechanisms open so that people can indeed use your work legally, that there is a pathway for that legal reuse. Um, and that also means that others can't reuse your work without your clear permission that they have to abide within the confines of the license in order to use that work properly um, so that you're getting the right kind of credit you're getting the right kind of usage people aren't intentionally mis misusing your data um, there are there are some types of licenses that we'd like to quickly cover um, so licenses for data or written content or media um, some permissive licenses are cco or cc by uh, and for software, some, some common permissive licenses, um, examples here, the MIT license, Apache 2.0 license, these give other people the boundaries at which they can work and use your work. Um, and it's important to have these kind of processes done so that everyone knows what are the rules that we're operating with? How can I use this properly? What's the right way to do it? Um, those are some important considerations. Ooh, we are moving quickly through here. So um, I'm going to quickly breeze through the slide that there are policies around sharing information depending on the organization. We kind of already covered that. What, and also what your funding organization might institute, et cetera. So not everything can be open all of the time. Um, obviously, publishing earlier and, 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 and what you can make publishable as early as possible. And also when you're reusing science, to do it ethically, to give credit properly, to use the licenses properly. That's the best way to ensure that your work is going to get used properly by also benefiting the community, by also performing those citations properly yourself. So there are some concerns and fears towards adopting open science. Um, and depending on where you are in that, you know, researcher platform, you might not be directly contributing to research results, but 
I think everyone has some concerns and fears about open science. And this is another good opportunity where for you guys to go to the Slido link and input any concepts or words that you associate that um, express your fears and concerns and worries about adopting open science. So we'll take a few minutes to go ahead and think about that. So I know like students might have fears about the, the work that they're being, the work that they're doing, it's not quite ready for publication, but they don't wanna get scooped on their thesis ideas. Misconduct, yeah, the stealing of ideas. Uh, misconduct is getting a lot of traction so far. Yeah, people misusing your work or misrepresenting your work. Um, scooping, I see, scooping, yeah, so you publish some concepts of an idea, but not all your finished products and someone comes in and takes your work and finishes it for you and they get all the credit for the discovery. Plagiarism, people not properly citing your work because it's out there in the world now and um, duplication of work, misinterpretation. Unintended consequences, yeah, that's a good one. You never really know how other people are going to take your work when it's just taken out there, it's out in the world. Butterfly effect, mistakes. It's a double-edged swords. False, real, use, yeah, deciding what is real and what is not real, that's a good one. Because there's so much out there, who knows what is uh, trustworthy. Mm -hmm. How it's being used, harassment, interesting. That's one I don't see a lot. Bad use. Data privacy. Oh, that's a good one because we just talked about all the things that should not be open and privacy concerns are a big one. Is that you or is that my phone? Thank you. Incorrect use of science. Improper use, cultural barriers, that's a good one. Lack of credibility, interesting. Lack of recognition, so that kind of goes back to um, to plagiarism. Ending up in the wrong hands, ooh, interesting. Someone who wants to misuse your science for negative reasons, mismanagement. <laughs> Cry emoji, <laughs> like it. Mad science. Digital divide, interesting, yeah. Discrimination, competition. Yeah, so misconduct, misinterpretation, data privacy, and false is coming up a lot. Lack of credibility, I like all of these. All of these are really good concerns. Um, AI misuse, that's a good one. Inequality. Career advancement. Uh, okay, like the limit limitations on career advancement, perhaps. Misuse of information. Yeah, these are really good. Um, yes, scooping. Sustainability. Hmm, that's a good one. Competition. Competition is coming up. Yeah, these are really good concerns, um, and we don't really have time to kind of address all of them um, today, but we, we do, open science actually helps mitigate a lot more of these than I think people realize. Um, for example, like the mistake, uh, the mistakes made or misinterpretation of data, actually, let's go to, um, let's go to misinterpretation since that kind of came up quite a bit. Um, misinterpretation of science happens regardless of if it's open or not. Um, people will take what's out there and they will interpret it according to the framework that they have and the tools that they have. And the best way actually to make sure your, your work doesn't get misinterpreted is to make sure you've included enough of it so that they can reproduce your results exactly. So a lot of science can't be reproduced that well because the, the data isn't made available or the code that we use to process that data isn't made available or there's just not enough detail in the written report to actually reproduce those results. So the best way to 
um, prevent the misinterpretation, misinterpretation of your work is to make sure that it's documented well enough that anyone could come in to it and look at it and interpret it correctly. Um, let's see. Scooping is another one that came up. And yeah, this can definitely happen. Depositing your work early and making it citable, making it have those DOIs associated with it is actually a really, really good way to prevent scooping because you'll have a historical record that shows you were the one, you were there with that established idea. Here it was established. This is where you can go to find that information. Um, so you have a lot of proof and um, ability to back up your, your case if you ever wanted to apply for patents, for example, that those ideas were established by you earlier than people who might be scooping you. Um, let's see, what were some other concerns? Yeah, sensitive information, um, following appropriate anonymization or using controlled access can be um, concerning for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if, uh, going back to the word cloud, yeah, the mistakes that can be made, other people can can find your mistakes easier and that can kind of be intimidating because you don't really want to, your mistakes to be public, uh, publicized. But this is how science is done. It's done that way now and it's just done faster if you allow for open science. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go through the rest of these pretty quickly. But um, a lot of these fears, there are mitigations for them. And obviously we don't have strategies for every single one of those fears. There are still concerns that we as a community need to work on solutions for. Um, but it, it turns out that a lot of these fears are not as real as we think they are. They're just kind of more in our heads. And if we actually adopted open science principles, we could mitigate a lot of these fears a lot more than we think we can at this point in time. Okay, so moving on to the next module, uh, planning for open science or the next lesson. Uh, from theory to practice, um, what, what we're really talking about here is planning your whole scientific workflow so that you're thinking about open science from the onset. You're answering questions like, where can I share this? How can I share it? When should I make the data publicly available? How can I best share that result for my project? How, can, how long should I plan to maintain my software? How am I going to store all the data that I collect? How, am I, how can I best collaborate on writing software? Um, and there's many more questions that are you know, useful to think about, but kind of the point here is that these questions, they need answers right at the beginning of research processes so that you're, you're planning for them and you're proce doing processes to allow for these to be solved well early on in the process. Um, and NASA has actually started making um, what's called an open science data management plan required for a lot of its funding opportunities. Um, basically, this is an opportunity for scientists to, at the beginning of their research, think about how is that data going to be managed? How is the software going to be managed? How is it going to be made public for, uh, for sharing? Uh, what other open science activities are going to be involved here and who is responsible for all of these different roles. Um, this is what NASA is now requiring on its researchers to fund those opportunities so that from the very get go, they are thinking about it and they are planning for it and they're doing things so that um, they're doing it, they can have the opportunity to do it correctly. Um, and it's not just data, it's not just research outputs either. It's also things like blog posts and um, workshops and meetings and presentations. All of those things can be made public and people can access them. P members of the community sometimes can access those a little bit more easily because they're a little bit more digestible sometimes. So even those kinds of um, um, results should also be considered when, when trying to plan for open science activities. Okay, so we've kind of come to the end of our presentation here. And um, obviously there's so much more to open science and, and a lot of you are just getting started in your science careers perhaps, or, or um, would like to know a lot more about how you can better implement open science principles. Um, and we would encourage you to continue the rest of the curriculum, the OS 101 curriculum, um, going on to the open tools, open code, open data, open results. You can take the full curriculum online. Um, there's actually a couple of different ways that you can take the curriculum. One is the self-paced online course. 
um, that we'll give you the link for a little bit later. And you can just go and kind of learn these concepts at your own pace. And there's also going to be many, many opportunities in the coming years for instructor led trainings, like kind of what we're doing here, workshops and virtual, both in person and virtual, um, that you'll have the ability to discuss, you know, and actually have a more collaborative kind of uh, dialogue. Um, so be on the lookout for those kinds of opportunities. We do have a link here for you to go and explore the um, Tufts website and the Open Science 101 curriculum. Um, do we actually want them to use this QR code? Yes. Okay, Absolutely. yes. Go use this QR code if you want to take the rest of the modules. Um, at this point, you really should have enough information that to, to go ahead and take the, the final assessment at the end of module one, which should give you credit for um, module one. Um, and then you can go on to take the rest of the modules as you're interested in them um, and you know, move on to, to taking the whole course and you can earn your, your TOPS badge. Um, at this point, I think we'd like to just open it up to any questions or any other input that we might have from, from the group. Um, go ahead and feel free to unmute yourself or type in the chat anything that you'd like to ask. Yep, we have a hand raised. Um, please go ahead. Unmute yeah, yourself. go ahead. Unmute yourself. I just wanted to ask, like, will we get that batch you just showed right now, or we will get the digital one, even though we are uh, from oh. another country or global joining the, for the course? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so you will get the digital badge, it, like, more immediately um, after you complete all five modules. And the pins, I believe, we're trying to send them to everyone. We are trying to send those to everybody. That's logistically very complicated, but we, that is the goal. Yes, <laughs> yes. And in, in the spirit of being open, I won't lie to you, it's <laughs> difficult to send send pins around, we, we find out. Um, so uh, if you if you are in another country, just please work with, that, with us, uh, reach out to us. Um, uh, we're very easy to reach by email, um, which we can... <laughs> Which we can we can help you with, uh, but uh, any any opportunity there is to get you a physical certificate, a paper certificate that is signed by our leaders here at NASA, um, and the uh, and the gold pin. Uh, more immediately, there is a digital badge that you can use. Uh, for example, when you're when you're uh, looking for new jobs, it can be attached to your orchid. It can be attached to uh, your LinkedIn um, or other social media um, or your resumes. Uh, it is certified through a company called Credly. Uh, and uh, and it, it, says, it says that you have been certified in NASA Open Science. All right, that's wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And just to reiterate, because I saw it a few times in the chat, um, where to go to get your badge. Here's the website right here. You can either use the QR code or, uh, or go to this link, openscience101.org, and you can enroll in the curriculum. Um, and you have, to, you have to do module one first, which you have now done. Um, so you guys can test out of the assessment and move on to the rest of the modules um, that you're interested in. So I just wanted to go back to that page so people could continue the access to the QR code. Also, I believe we're going to make these slides available to you guys in case that is of interest to people. Yes, absolutely. So you guys will have all of the content that was presented today. Does the program have any plans to translate this course and offer it in other languages like Portuguese? Uh, that's a great question. Um, already efforts are, are ongoing to translate it into Spanish. That's already uh, an ongoing effort by some of some of the other uh, community members of the TOPS team. Um, into specifically Portuguese, I'm not familiar with any specific efforts to translate into Portuguese, but I suspect the efforts that we're going through right now for the translation into science, a lot of this, or into Spanish, a lot of the same challenges will arise to translate to any language um, and we're realizing we did develop we've made some mistakes you know that that make it harder to translate into other languages and we're trying to work through some of those and fix some of those so that it's a little bit easier to translate into any language um, 
So yeah, that's a great question. We would love to translate it into languages that people are interested in receiving this information in. Amazing. Um, Thank you so much, Genevieve and Paul. This was such an incredible workshop. Um, I know many of you still may have questions for Jen or Paul. Um, I believe Paul put in the chat um, an email address that you can contact the TOPS project office. Um, and as a reminder, you will get a recording of these slides uh, and the presentation itself from today. Um, before you head out, please do um, fill out the poll that you'll see live on your screen at the moment. And thank you so much to the Transformed Open Science team. As you all know, TOPS is one of our sponsors for the Collective Genius Summit, and we couldn't have done this whole program without them. So thank you again so much for sharing all your wisdom and insight. And I think we have some, some folks that are really eager to get the certification as soon as possible. So that's, that's fantastic.